Hello and welcome. My name is Lori Rubin and I have the pleasure of introducing a living legend in the world of photography, Vincent Versace. Vincent is one of Nikon's 16 founding Nikon ambassadors and is a recipient of many prestigious awards. His work can be found in the permanent collection in the Smithsonian Institute's Museum of American History. He is the author of best-selling books from Oz to Kansas, almost every black and white technique known to mankind, and Welcome to Oz 2.0, a cinematic approach to digital still photography with Photoshop. His book, Welcome to Oz, has been selected as Shutterbug Magazine's best how-to book of the year. Vincent's work has been highlighted in all the major photography magazines, and he is a master class instructor and a member of the National Association of Photoshop Professionals Instructor Dream Team. He was also instrumental in helping Nick Software develop the Nick Collection. As he says, my DNA is in this software. Glad you could join us today, Vincent. I'm glad I could be here. I, I, it makes my day to no end to be able to show off what I think is probably the crown jewels of photography, which is the Nick Collection, specifically Silver FX Pro 2.0. Um, it just makes my day. And the fact that DxO took the time and the effort to keep this alive, I cannot begin to applaud and thank DxO for doing it. That said, let's go for a spin in software mania. Um, so if you're into infrared, which I am, I've been doing it since uh, 2003 or four, uh, I've had a lot of time to play with it. So what you're going to see are the th observations that I have made in working with digital infrared files in that time frame. So um, the, I'm working on a new book project, which is going to be called 21st Century Composition Theory, and it's going to cover everything from how it all works, including black and white conversion, and specifically infrared. And the part of the infrared is entitled In the Heat of the Light coming to therms with digital infrared photography. And yes, I'm into puns. With that said, do remember this, everything I write has precedence in truth, to quote Ian Fleming. And the most important thing is to keep in mind what Albert Einstein thought of light. So if in 50 years of conscious brooding about light and it's brought him no closer to the question of what is light, um, if he couldn't figure the answer, um, I think everybody else who talks about it is, like he said, deluding themselves. So let's look at all of the things. Hold on one second. I need to move this panel so I can read what I'm saying. These are the important things I think you need to keep in common or keep in mind with regard to producing an image in infrared. The most common way to produce light is from something hot. That's how light is made. The, um, that's also known as black body radiation. The way the sun makes light is it's a hot thing that produces light. Half the energy that hits our planet is infrared. And it's a part of the spectrum of infrared that we work with is called near infrared. It's broken into two parts. Far infrared is the one that involves the actual seeing of heat Near infrared is the part of the spectrum that is just past our visible spectrum. So what we have is lights broken down into nanometers and the range of near infrared is between 700 and 900 nanometers. Far infrared is a thousand nanometers up and that's used for thermal imaging, which is not what happens in photographic infrared. So that you understand where we're looking at. This is the whole entire enchilada of the spectrum of radiation that comes from the um, from the sun that's out there and that a small part of it is visible light, a very, very tiny part. If we look at what a sensor can see, it is from 350 nanometers up to 1200 nanometers or more of a sensor the sensor is more capable of seeing into the infrared than it is actually into visible light. And what happens in a camera is that there's something put in front of it um, that blocks infrared. That's called a dark mirror and only allows visible spectrum. So what I've done is I've had a camera modified to shoot infrared by removing 
the uh, dark mirror and replacing it with one that blocks out the visible spectrum and allows um, infrared to be seen. Do keep in mind that when you do this, you do void the warranty on your camera. So let's take a look at a comparison of images shot with the same camera, one modified for infrared, one for visible spectrum. And if you look at my uh, praying monk here, what you see in the visible spectrum is none of the reflections off of the multi-coating of the infrared. That's because the lens is designed to see in the visible spectrum and they don't need to pay attention to what happens in the infrared. However, it's two decidedly different realities. Again here, same girl shot with the same camera with the same lens, one modified for infrared, one for visible spectrum. And the difference in the image is breathtaking. For me, infrared has always been this experience of having this world that's just beyond what I can touch, just beyond what I can see, but I'm still participating in the world that it exists. Also, if you look at the uh, Yosemite Fall, green here on the visible spectrum is dark, but green in infrared is light. And why this is, is that um, one of the fills, xylophil, chlorophyll, um, there is all these multiple different types of chemicals basically that the plant uses to produce the energy that keeps it alive, some of them reflect the infrared. Now that is what's causing the foliage to become white, that the radiation is being reflected off of the leaves and the sensor is recording that reflected radiation and that makes it white. The same way that a negative would work is the same way that a sensor works in this situation. So that when light energy, solar light energy hits green plants, they have a tendency to fluoresce or become lighter or white. Again, different fabrics and different dyes will respond differently. This is again the same camera, same lens, but if we look at the green turban, or the red turban rather, the red turban photographs white because it's reflecting back um, the infrared radiation, same as the white here. If we look at skin tone, the same thing occurs, that there are two different realities that are occurring. Both are the same subject, both are pretty to look at. One is what we see, one is a little ethereal. All right, so let's come to therms with the heat of the light. Although there are other ways to create light other than heat, the light we are photographing when capturing a digital infrared image is caused by heat. However, it is not the heat of the light you are photographing. It is the light caused by the outcome of the heat. Your light meter is balanced to expose for visible spectrum. This is, I'll show this in a second, and this is very important. Why tree leaves and plants photograph white in infrared capture is because chlorophyll, what causes tree leaves and plants to appear green, does not absorb infrared radiation, which means that if it's not being absorbed, it's being reflected. Infrared light focuses at a slightly different focus point than visible spectrum. Why this is important is if you're using a DSLR, you're going to have to have the camera compensated for if you're going to do a conversion. If you're using mirrorless to do this, the beauty of mirrorless is that mirrorless focuses off of the sensor. Now, if you have a DSLR, if you can use live view, which is focusing off the sensor, you'll get a much sharper image than if you use through the lens focusing unless the camera is compensated and adjusted for that. So it is more important, even more important to use the lens fine tuning functionality of your camera to dial in the focus for maximum sharpness. That is also very important. All modern cameras today have the ability for you to fine tune focus so that the lens and the camera are matched perfectly. That is critical if you're going to shoot infrared. So let's look at visible spectrum exposure using an in-camera metering system. So I set my camera when I'm shooting to monochrome. And the reason why I do that is that it is much easier for me to understand what the image looks like 
seeing it in the grayscale. Now I'm shooting raw, which means that I have the ability to rebake my cake. But in monochrome, I can see what the luminance values are going to be. And why that's important is if we look at right here on the as shot processed in Nikon Capture NXD, what you should notice is that there is a difference between the red and the green and the blue channels, that there is more information occurring in the blue and red channels and more change than is in the green channels. And the reason for the green channel, and the reason for that is because in infrared, the green channel basically just contains the luminance, the light to dark values. It's the red and blue channels in which the variation changes in the image. Now, why that's important has to do with the effective resolution of any camera that you're using. Simply put, if I have a 36 megapixel camera, what that means is that the Bayer array, the way the sensor is set up, will go red, green, red, green, red, green, green, blue, green, blue, green, blue. Or I will have twice as much green data as I will have red and blue, which means that I'll have nine red, 18 green, and nine blue. In infrared, it's basically, I have effective nine in the red, effective green, nine in the green, and effective nine in the blue, because there is only luminance recording in the green channel, that it basically only holds that information. Why that's important with regard to um, exposure is that the light meter is balanced for visible spectrum. If you look at the bottom, what we can see here is that the, the first one is proper exposure. Oops, let's get back here. The first one is proper exposure. The second one is one stop under. And the third one is two stops under. Now, in visible spectrum, that's really, really dark. But in infrared, it's between one stop and two stops that gives me proper exposure because the green is reflecting back light or back radiation in which the camera records, but the meter is designed for visible spectrum. So what you have to do is in every situation that you change, take a picture, look at the back of your camera and make a determination as to what manual adjustment you need to make with regard to exposure. That the, the meter is helpful, but it's not designed to um, meter for infrared. Now, one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind and I frequently get asked is, well, what about faux infrared using post, post capture conversions? Let's look at that. So this is an as shot Nikon capture white balanced IR image of all of these dye powders um, that you see on the right. Now you notice that there's a lot of variation in the color, but if we look at the bottom row because of the way in which they reflect um, the infrared part of the spectrum, they all basically appear to be white. So what you're looking at is what is recorded reality. And again, same camera, same lens, just one for visible spectrum, one for um, IR. So this is white balanced in Nikon Capture NXD. And this is using the channel mixer IR preset. Notice the difference in the variation of colors that the bottom row has blacks and dark grays where on the visible spectrum side using a um, software approach that are not apparent in the white balanced um, IR capture. This is using capture of uh, Photoshop uh, light black and white adjustment layer. Again, let's look at a uh, human. So if you notice here, that the dress on the right is black and red, and there is a redness to the skin tone. If we look on the image on the left, that there's really no difference between the um, grays in the black and in the um, red. And that has to do with the fact that this particular fabric reflects back infrared. So it's most likely not a natural fiber, it's a polyester. Okay, so if we look at using the, um, channel mixer preset, 
see how dark everything becomes, whereas the properly white balanced one doesn't contain that amount of darkness. And the same is true when we look at the black and white adjustment layer. So if we look at the difference between these two, what we see is that there's a, a great variation that simply is not what infrared would see. You actually have a closer to reality by simply just doing global desaturation. All right, so here's the conclusion here. That just because you can turn green into white in software does not mean that you can turn red it will turn red to black. That just because it appears to be a dark color um, in the visible part of the spectrum does not mean that it will photograph dark in the infrared part of the spectrum. You cannot realistically create or replicate an infrared image from a visible spectrum image. That's my experience and my humble considered opinion. Okay. The difference between analog versus digital. And I think that there's an incredible argument for digital infrared over analog. So let's look at that. First, film requires that it be refrigerated. That means that you have to store it before being shot and after being shot, otherwise it will fog. It has to be unloaded when you're using a film camera in a light tight changing bag or a completely dark room. Requires filters on the lens for the best effect. Filters on the lens create filter factors which cause all sorts of exposure issues in that you have less speed when you shoot. Needs to be manually focused to a different focus point um, than visible spectrum. Older lenses um, have a red dot on the barrel. This is the adjustment point for infrared. So you'd focus and then you'd move whatever you focused on to match that point. Most importantly, infrared film is no longer manufactured. So the closest that you can get is Ilford F SFX 200 ISO, though not actually an infrared film, you can, with a 720 nanometer filter, um, create infrared. However, you need a lot of light, right? The other thing that's important is it will fog if you send it through an X-ray machine. So it's not something that travels well. Film cameras can shoot both infrared and visible spectrum. This is because the film is what determines the sensitivity. Film has a theoretical DMAX of four, but never really exceeded three or a 10 stop dynamic range or approximately 1,024 levels of gradation. Um, the best silver paper ever made had a DMAX of 2.2 of a, or approximately 158 levels of gradation. Okay, now digital infrared doesn't require that it be stored in a refrigerator, doesn't need to be loaded or unloaded in a film bag, does not require filters on the lens for best effects, still focuses at a different focus point than visible spectrum, but with modern cameras and lenses, they can be fine-tuned and adjusted because a DSLR camera actually sees more in the infrared spectrum than the visible spectrum. The camera can be modified by changing the filter in front of the sensor. DSLR cameras um, modified to capture the near-infrared part of the spectrum can shoot from 100 ISO, depending on the camera, to 6400 ISO, depending on the camera, and with today's cameras, sky's the limit. Because there is an LCD display on the back, you can see what the capture image looks like and make any corrections to exposure instantly. However, once the camera is modified, it can only shoot in the near infrared spectrum. Modern cameras have a DMAX of 4.2 um, or 14 stops of dynamic range or approximately 15,849 stops levels of gradation. Inkjet paper has a DMAX of 2.6. In this instance, actually, we have papers now that have even more. Um, exhibition fiber paper has approximately 398 levels of gradation. What does that mean? That if you take in the subjective aesthetics of metallic qualities of silver paper and silver-based films out of the equation and comparing apples to apples, digital infrared photography is a better all-around proposition than film infrared photography. So let's look at what a properly white balanced image should look like with our groundwork laid. This is what the camera will capture when you set it to um, Adobe RGB. What a properly white balanced infrared should look like is this. So it should be a slightly bluish with some warmth to it file. Um, in the seminar that I will be doing at b and I'll show you how to do this. But because I have a finite amount of time here, I want to get through this and show you what it looks like and then move into tweaking 
an image. So that's the dog and pony on how to do this. This is the image that we're going to use. Get that out of the way. Now, what I've created in the process of making this book is that I've, I'm coming up with a series of actions. Now, the actions will have descriptolators and turbolators, and I'm going to run the descriptolator. And what that means is the descriptolator will have granular descriptions of absolutely everything that you can do. And to put this into perspective, this is the IR olator. Um, and these are all of the steps that are involved that have been automated. Now, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a ride. And why I'm going to use the descriptolator version of it is so that you can see that there are descriptions of how everything works. We're going to take a little bit of an advanced way of using um, Silver Effects Pro. Now we're going to create something called a chord. And what that means in um, image editing parlance is that I'm going to use multiple variations of the same thing. Like you would use multiple notes on a piano, I'm going to use multiple variants, variations of Silver Effects. Now, I think Silver Effects Pro is probably of the most inspired pieces of software I've ever worked with, and I think as close to a perfect piece of software as you're ever going to see. Do keep in mind, I do have my DNA in that software, so I do have a, a dog in that fight. That said, let's run the action. To run an action, you just hit play. Now, what's going to come up is a note that's going to tell you what to do. In this instance, it's going to tell you how to name the um, file. Now, it is important if you're going to engage in something called a non-destructive workflow to give absolutely everything meaningful names. So in this instance, I'm going to make sure that the end of the description is going to say SCP-2 IR chord. That's going to tell me exactly what it is that I'm doing. So let's go here. I'm going to go Command or Control A, then C to copy it. I'm going to go to the desktop, and since I've already set this up, I am going to click on the name of my file, and then I'm going to paste SCP-2 IR chord. And so what I will have is a meaningful name and what it is that I'm doing. I'm going to hit Save. Now, I use PSB, which is the Large Document File Format. And the reason I do that in my workflow is I use the way in which Photoshop will save files. You have TIFFs, Photoshop Documents, PSD, and Large Documents, PSB as in boy. The reason why the Large Document File Format exists has to do with anything over two gigs. So you can't save a file in PSD if it's over two gigabytes. That sounds like a lot. Wait until we see 100 uh, megapixel cameras. We're already able to produce files that are huge. So I set up a workflow that whenever I see a PSB as in boy, I know it's a working file. Whenever I see a PSD as in David, I know it's a printing file. And whenever I see a PSD, uh, a TIFF, I know that it's a transitory file, a file from the raw processor to Photoshop or the file in which I'll save this final that I'll make into things. So let's hit save. If you also notice that I am working in the Pro Photo RGB color space and in 16-bit. I'll go over that at the BNH seminar as well during the course of the week as to why you want to do that. So let's hit save. Now, what's going to happen is we're going to see um, the red, green, and blue channels. And so what we can do is observe what the differences is in them, because what we're going to do with silver effects is create the perfect variations of the red and blue channels and then blend those together. So I'm going to hit continue. 
So this is the actual red channel. That's what the red channel looks like. That's its interpretation of red in the grayscale. This is the blue channel. You should see that there was a difference between the red and the blue channel. Okay, now what we're going to do here is we're going to create a series of smart objects. And again, in the seminar next week, I'll show you exactly why you want to do that by showing you a couple of things about smart objects. But for a non-destructive workflow, in a nutshell, what a smart object allows me to do is it allows me to go back if I need to and make adjustments. So I'm going to click continue and the action is going to run. At this point, I take a sip of coffee, the magic elixir of life, and see if there are any questions I need to answer. Okay, um, a couple people were asking, uh, let's see here. Uh, the infrared images appear soft when compared to the visible spectrum images. Can you address this discrepancy? Yes, I can. It has to do with the nature of infrared light and what I've observed, and I don't know why this is. So um, I've just observed it, that the closer the object is to the lens, the sharper it is, the further it is away from the lens, even if I'm focused on it, the softer things will become. I think that that has to do with, and I'm researching this, the inherent nature of the way in which infrared light glows, um, which is why a mirrorless camera with regard to infrared is a better idea than using a DSLR in that I'm focusing right off the sensor. Because visible spectrum light focuses in a different point than infrared, that also contributes to that. So having the ability to um, focus right off of the sensor um, helps. The other thing to keep in mind is that you really do want to work at a aperture at f8, f8 or f11, depending upon the critical aperture of the lens. Why that is, is f8 or f11, somewhere in that area, is where light is most evenly distributed across the sensor plane, which produces the sharpest image. Stopping a lens down only increases the area of acceptable out of focus. It doesn't necessarily increase sharpness. Also, you want to use lenses if you're going above 24 megapixel that are designed for going above 24 megapixel. In the um, Nikon paradigm, which is what I can speak uh, for, because I shoot Nikon, you want to shoot with nano-coated lenses. Nano-coated lenses will produce the sharpest possible image that Nikon can produce, that Nikon glass can produce. If it's not nano-coated, it's not really designed to shoot above 24 megapixels. What else before I move into the next part of my little song and dance? Okay, um, some just general questions about who can uh, modify or make IR modifications to cameras and a general idea of the cost which I'm sure kind of varies. It varies on the camera and it varies on what it is that you're going to do. I have found um, that the best um, place to do it is a place called Life Pixel. That's where I've gone to have um, several of my cameras modified. Um, I have had every modify, every way to, to do it. 700 nanometers is the one that I tend to like, which is um, enhanced color. Uh, that gives me the best of both worlds. There are, uh, I don't like deep infrared, which is too far down the infrared path and all the images are soft. Um, super color is great, but um, I shoot a mix of landscape and um, I shoot uh, people. So I wanna have a camera that can give me the biggest bang for the buck. Now I have found that having the dark mirror replaced produces, I think, a better image than putting a filter in front of the lens and having the dark mirror removed. And here's why, and it's a very, very important thing to keep in mind. Um, it is the first element of the lens that determines the entire quality and integrity of the image. So the first piece of glass. So if you have cheap filters in front of your lens, you're degrading the image regardless of how expensive that lens is. So either take off the glass lens cap that is an um, UV filter or get a nano-coated UV filter. That's important. Um, 
with visible spectrum, it's not as mission critical as it is with infrared, though it is mission critical. But with regard to infrared, that particular um, aspect of it is extraordinarily mission critical. One more question, and then I can move into. Well, people are asking about your book on infrared when it'll be released. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's that. I'm I'm the victim of my own success. I travel so much um, that I it's it's been slowed down a bit. And then I had a flood in my studio where the roof gave out, and so I've been going through um, roof repair hell, and that has also slowed me down. The goal is to have it done as an ebook by the end of the year and right now what's happening is in my classes that I teach on black and white and infrared I'm having the students that take them beta test the action to make sure that it's not broken um, the other goal with regard to the actions that I'll be putting out is I'm going to have them translated uh, the descriptions into Spanish French and German and hopefully Chinese and Japanese, but I haven't found translators for that. Um, if you do speak those languages natively and would like to help me out, send me an email. All right, I'm going to move into this. So now when you do this, um, the only thing that you cannot touch on this is the color filters. They're set to a preset, all right? Now, what I think is absolutely great and something that I think that DxO excels in is the ability to emulate film types and look at all the new films that got added. Now that's great for black and white conversion with regard to if you have an aesthetic look that you like from back in the day. I would not suggest necessarily doing that with infrared but with regard to making a full spectrum conversion from a color file into a chromatic grayscale file, that's great. And if anybody does it the best, it's DxO. And the fact that DxO got access to what was probably the most inspired, one of the most inspired parts of this is the replication of reality with the grain engine in that there is no grain in, um, highlights or it reduces to nothing as you go up the zone system into zone eight zone nine and there is no grain in deep shadow as you go from uh, zone three two to one where grain exists in film was in the middle part and the grain engine in silver effects is designed to replicate that now what you can do here depending on how soft or hard and how many grains per pixel you put is you can replicate deep tank replenishment so if you're a gearhead zony from back in the day like i am rejoice silver effects has come up with a solution for that and dxo has expanded that ability greatly in a way in which i coveted when nick was a company and used to look with envy at dxo for what they were able to do. I can say that now, but I couldn't say that then. Now, here are all of the bells and whistles that you have that you can play with. You have all of this control in brightness. You can control highlights, midtone shadows, dynamic brightness, which holds the um, center part of the image, but adjusts the highs and lows. You have contrast control where you can amplify whites, amplify blacks and soft contrast, which works in the same way as dynamic brightness. And then you have structure. Most importantly is fine structure. Fine structure is your friend with regard to infrared, and that helps to address the issue of the softness of infrared um, that is different than the hardness of capture in visible spectrum. Another side note, what's the best type of light to photograph infrared? Craptastic light. What does that mean? That's light in the middle of the day. This is 12 o'clock in the afternoon. What do I know about the light at 12 o'clock in the afternoon? Very bright, very hard, and not really conducive to visible spectrum. However, infrared loves that because the more infrared energy there is for plants to absorb and to reflect off of, 
the harder the edge of the image becomes and the more defined the edge of the image becomes, the, sharp, the apparent sharpness of the image increases. That is an observation that I have made as to why that is. I'm sure I will have an answer for that by the time I go to publication, but that is just an observation based on having done a lot of years of work in an infrared. So right now, let me get out of this for a second. What we are in is, did I screw up? Nope, I didn't screw up. There we go. What we are in is the um, blue channel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make adjustments using control points. Now control points are the coolest darn thing known to man. And how a control point works, let's bring this up here so we can get all of it, is I have brightness, contrast, structure, um, amplify white, amplify black, and fine structure, and selective color, which I don't use. That's more for um, if I want to make a red rose in a black and white photograph. I would use that for portrait social. Now, what I can do is I can darken or lighten just this area. And let me show you what else you can do. So if I put that there, and this is based on where is that little bugger? Let's look at what the this is the actual area, and you see as as I move this, how the control point changes based on reading the data of the area in which the point is on. There is no better way that I know of to produce a mask than using a control point. So I can darken areas. So I want to darken that up. And then I can put another control point here and watch what happens when I put this control point here. When I put that control point here, what occurs is this control point and this control point come together and build an edge. And I can see see how by reducing the size of the control point, I can also affect a change in that area. So I can darken that. Or in this case, if I want to, I can lighten up that area so that I can have this area be dark and this area be light. I can come in here and I can click on this and let's lighten up our cows. Now, if I go Command or Control D, I can duplicate the control point with exactly the same um, amount of effect. I can also, if I select these two, I can lock them if I so, so desire or I can select them and I can have them work in concert with each other so that I can adjust them together. Let's darken up our clouds a little bit. Now that's pretty. And let's darken up the clouds here. Now do you see how it affects the cloud a bit more than it's affecting the leaves. That's because the control point is looking at the data on the point that it is selected and comparing that to all the other data around it. And I've said, work on this, but not the other stuff. One of the most inspired things to occur, see how in any image editing software is a control point. And the beauty of this is that control points are all the way through all of the NIC um, collection by DxO. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Not only is it in all of the NIC collection by DxO, but it's also in Photolab 3, which I think is a cool thing to have in software. OK, so I can now brighten up this if I want. I can amplify the white aspect of it. The other thing that I can do here, if I'm so inclined, is I can protect, see, the highlights or the shadows. So I can put a limit as to what it is that I'm doing based on 
what it is that I'm doing. So I have tonality protection. Now tonality protection is also all the way through the Nick collection by DxO, Color Effects Pro, Silver Effects Pro um, plugins. So I can do that. I can also use fine structure. And what fine structure will do, and let's see if we can get an idea of what's going on there, is, yeah, my monitor's not, yeah, there we go. Do you see how all of a sudden the fine structure defined this a bit more? And fine structure with regard to infrared is your best friend. Um, I wouldn't necessarily be that aggressive with it. I only did that to show you that, but I would put it, I would definitely consider using it. Now, where there are dark areas that I want to amplify, I can amplify the blacks. Where there are light areas, and you see how by working, amplifying these blacks, I can bring back this texture area here while still having the clouds separate out. Let's do a couple of more little control points. So the thing to keep in mind is that you have active control points and null control points. And what a null control point does is when it connects to this control point, it will build an edge, which is one of the really cool functionalities of the software. The other thing to keep in mind is I'm not trying to make the perfect image necessarily, what I'm trying to do is make the perfect blue channel. And I have the ability to have all of these bells and whistles to do that. Um, to get a little technical for a second, in photography, the way film worked was something called a tonal reproduction curve. And what that was, was it was the way in which film recorded the collision between red, green, and blue. So, Film is logarithmic, which means that, and digital is linear, so it's non-logarithmic. It's in simple terms. If I put a cup, of, uh, put a packet of sugar in a cup of coffee, if it was film, it would taste sweet. If I put two packets of sugar in a cup of coffee, it wouldn't taste twice as sweet. It would taste sweeter. In digital, if I put two packets of sugar into that cup of coffee, it would be twice as sweet. The reason why digital for me works better than film is that it's predictable. What I'm doing here is I am producing my own tonal reproduction curve that is image specific, which means I'm basically making my own film. And then I'm making changes to that image structure specific. So I can have tonal reproduction curves inside of tonal reproduction curves. So I can create images that simply could not be produced with film. And I think that that is powerful. So now what you should see here is that there is a difference in the quality of this image in that it is darker in value than the image was that came up before. And so what I'm gonna do here is make some adjustments. Let's go to my favorite part of this is amplify whites add fine structure, and watch this. Bam! See how I can control exactly how much of the effect that I have here? I'm gonna to come to here to my clouds, and I'm going to amplify the blacks in the clouds, and I am going to increase the overall radius. Now, as I do that, it affects a change here, but does not affect a change here because these two are working in concert with each other. And let's just go back here, shall we? And let's amplify that there. Now, do you see how I am able to bring out my clouds? Let's amplify my whites here. Perfect. One more. Let's darken. Let's darken you up just a bit. Both our blacks. Lower our brightness. Put a null control point there. You see how I got that back? 
open that up a little bit. So now what I have is I've knocked this down, maintain the integrity here, have my clouds darker, have my trees separated from my clouds, even though they share very similar values, knock this down while still maintaining uh, detail. Let's, let's, because I just, I'm control point happy, I, I am. Let's knock that down a bit and I'm gonna hit okay. Now it's time to take a sip of coffee. Any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Gregory was asking what defines best blue versus best red? What defines best blue versus best red? Using the uh, optical organic device in which all human beings have two of. Oh, what does that mean, you ask? Your eye, it's your opinion. When you look at it, what defines it is, what is visually appealing to me? What is it that I like about the redness of the image? What is it that I like about the blueness of this image? I'm not trying to make the blue look red. What I'm trying to do is make it the best blue to my eye. Oh, I like the way the blue channel handles the sky more than the red channel. So what does that tell me I'm going to do? I'm going to skew more for the blue to the red. I like the way the red handles the leaves more than the blue. So what does that tell me I'm going to do? It comes down to a, a very simple concept. Um, when you took the picture, you liked the picture. Otherwise, you wouldn't have taken it. But frequently, when we look at a picture, we go, oh, that sucks. Oh, I'm terrible. No, what's terrible is a tendency of the technology to not represent what it is that your vision is. So your goal is to bring the image back to what it is that is visually appealing to you. Okay, let me get into this. Now, you have some things here that you can do. You're not necessarily married to uh, blue versus red. I can make the red lead or the blue lead. The only thing that you can't touch is the color blend mode black and white. And what this is here for is to make sure that if you decide to paint on both, that if there's some overlap, you won't have a color bleed. So this is the one thing that you can't move, but these you can move. All right, so I can go see the change that I've been able to make. And you see the difference between the two. So that's red, that's blue. Between these two, which do I like more? Well, I like the red more. So in this instance, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lead with the red and I'm gonna brush in aspects of the blue. Okay, do you see how I looked at that and decided that I preferred to be red, blue, green, let's say if I had versus blue, green, red, or green, red, blue, if I were to have all three uh, colors. I can make a decision as to what it is that I want it to do based on how I want the filter to go up, how I want the image to um, move. Now I'm gonna fill my blue with black, which means the background color is black and the foreground color is white. And if I hit the letter X, you see what happens there? And if I have a diff different colors there, all I have to do is hit D and D will give me default, which will be black and white. I can just switch them based on what it is that I wanna do. Now I'm gonna fill the layer mask with black, see what happens here. And I'm gonna select my brush and I'm gonna to go to an opacity of 50%. And the reason why I'm gonna do that is that Layer masks work on the grayscale, on zero to 100%. So what do I know? I know that 50% is the middle. It's either gonna be 50%, more than 50%, or less than 50%. I have no idea what that percentage is. I just know that that is the case. And forgive me for not being as precise with the layer mask as I can be, but I'm gonna come in here, and I'm gonna brush just that area here. And if I go Command-Shift or Control-Shift-F, it will bring up the fade, whatever the heck it is, I just did dialog box, fade effect. And I can increase the amount or decrease the amount. But there's no way that I can know that what I want, again, based on looking at the image, that 81% is what I wanted the brush size or the amount of it to be. And if we look over here, and I do that again, watch what happens. 
see how that lightens and darkens that's what this dialog box does let's go back to here and I'm going to impress you Lori because I will be done right on time let's come in let's come in here and brush this area right in right there because I am a trained professional command shift F See how I can come in here and get that effect? Okay. A little brushing in here. In this instance, 50% is plenty. Command Shift F. Not that big a deal. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Command Shift F. Do I want more? No. I want 23%. All right, so now that I'm done there, I'm gonna hit play action and silver effects, or the action is gonna run all of this. Again, it's once again time to take a sip of coffee. The bigger your file, the longer it takes. And what's occurring with the action now is that the action is going to give me a warm tone. I like warm tone images. So I've set this up so that I can create tonality using silver effects. And it is set up, if we go all the way down to here, finishing adjustments, I can select what type of toning that I want. So I'm gonna select in this instance, 19, and I am going to reduce the strength to about 15%. The other thing that I can do, should I want to, is I can do vignetting in either a circle or a square. I can burn the edges in a square. Um, and so I can do the Ansel Adams making it dark on the sides that it comes in so that I draw your eye wherever it is that I want to go. Um, image borders, uh, um, I don't necessarily do. There are some that do and that's built in here and you have all these fancy borders that you can use. Um, the other thing that's cool is the zone system is built in. So when I click on this, when I'm analyzing the image, I can also determine if I have anything blown out. And what you should see is I have no zone nine um, which is um, white of the paper, but I do have zone eight, which is textured white. So I want to be in zone eight, zone seven, zone that, and I have no zone zero, which means no blocked up blacks, but I do have zone two, which is textured white. So we have a spot on image. I'm going to click OK. I will have my toned image. OK. Now, if I am so inclined and think that that's too much after I'm done, the other thing that I can do is I can go up here and diminish the amount of warmth that I put in the image. I'm going to hit start the action again. And take a sip of coffee, the magic elixir of life. And the action is going to save the document um, first as a, oh, nope, forgot that, define. So let's say I decide that there is more noise in this image than I want. Um, define, which is the Nick Collections um, noise reduction system, will engage. If I did my job correctly, which it looks like I did, I don't need define. I have to wait for it to finish analyzing. Um, but if I do, noise reduction is at the end. Now, I know that Canon says that you do noise reduction first and sharpening last, but my point would be that makes no sense to me in that if I have noise and noise is a form of smudging or blurring the image, why would I want to blur the image only to come back and try and redefine the edges? I find that doing noise reduction at the end is a more effective way of doing it than doing noise reduction at the beginning. 
because I don't know what is image structure and what is noise until after I've done all of the image editing that I'm going to do. So I tend to do my noise reduction after. In this image, um, I don't need define. The reason why it will come up is that actions um, an action I have, when I make an action, I make it so that every possibility that I might need is built into the action. And if I don't need it, I don't use it. So I'm gonna click OK. The action is going to produce a cleanup layer. So if there's um, orbitals, UFOs, schmutz stuff, bug parts, whatever, on your image, this is the place to do it. Not at the beginning, but at the end. And the reason for that is that all image enhancement technologies um, use edge enhancement. So you're building a texture. So if I spot heal, like for instance, what I would take out would be these wires, let's say. I would do this now, not at the beginning, because I run the risk um, if I use aggressive edge detection software, which is what all image enhancing software is, um, I will see the edge of what it is that I removed. So it is better to match the texture and pattern at the end, not at the beginning. But for this image, I don't need that. I'm going to click OK, or excuse me, click Run. And what I'm going to get is a final on the top. Now, the other reason why I, or the reason why I made this image retouching is if I decide that there are some things that are an audible, that I want, and let's just click OK. This is in case you decide that you want a vignette. So I use Color Effects Pro 4 to do lens vignetting so that everything is built into the action should you decide that you need it. Now, here, the action is now going to save it to the folder in which I saved the original PSB. And I'm now at the end of my song and dance. So question, and right at 10 o'clock. Yeah, very good. <laughs> OK, I'm just going to ask you two questions, and then we'll go ahead and end this presentation. Uh, there's questions about where can they get your actions? Um, you can't get my actions now because they're in the process of being developed. They're going to come out with the book and tutorial um, that I'm going to produce. They're not quite ready for prime time. Um, so you can look at it this way. Either I'm going to give you the action for free and charge you for the book, or I'm going to give you the book for free and charge you for the actions. Um, I mean, it just, it's just part of the whole uh redoing of the black and white book and redoing the whole thing. I'm going to put that all together. Giving you the action without having a, me having a, a feeling that you have a solid understanding of the power tool you're playing with, I don't want to hurt you. I want you to, <laughs> I, I know they can be a little difficult. The, the takeaway from this is you can actually build your own action. It's simple enough. So create a, a smart object, set uh, one channel for red, one channel for blue. Um, and feel free to look at the video and replicate exactly what it is that I did and make your own. It's, it's simple enough. Um, it's the, uh, and, and play with it. It's not, they're not that difficult to make. Did I just ruin my livelihood? Oh my God, no. Uh. <laughs> okay, last question. Um, do you ever create customized presets or recipes? when you're using silver effects or any of the other products in the Nick collection? Um, you can, and if you've got a defined look for color, you should consider that. But because my action basically is that on steroids. But I think that the ability to come up with um, a mix in a plugin is, is helpful. For example, um, I like a warm tone image. Yes, I can create a recipe uh, preset for that so that when I hit that, it will automatically do that. Why I don't do that when I teach and why I don't do that when I make an action is it's not my place to tell you what right is. It's my place to show you how you can make right for you. Um, so yes, if you've come up with a style, a look, a way you want your images to be, then what you should do is simplify your life by making those things automated. 
And the fact that the software is capable of doing that is a really helpful and profound thing. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap this up. Vincent, that was a fantastic presentation, very in-depth and uh, lots of great, great information here. So I hope you all enjoyed it as well. So thank you very much. And if you want to see more uh, Vincent's work or learn more about him, you can always go to his website. It's VersacePhotography.com. You got it, VersacePhotography.com. It also has a schedule, I notice, of your workshops and uh, I think you're uh, traveling next month as well. So I he's am. a very busy guy. <laughs> I'm going to Myanmar to, uh, I'm working on a book project in which is uh, Myanmar, um, Cuba, and India. And with regard to what is going on in Myanmar, it's timely that I'm going to go there and record some of the stuff that's happening. Because what I'm trying to do is record that country's emergence into the 21st century, as well as Cuba's emergence into the 21st century and capturing the echo of India's past in the 21st century. Because of all the societies that I have gone to, I find that India is the only country that I have ever been to where that country has figured out how to keep the integrity of what is truly Indian, the rituals and traditions of thousands of years while owning an iPad and a cell phone. It, and so it's looking at the echo of the 19th century, looking at the echo of 1962, and looking at the echo of the 1800s in India is what this project is. And I'm going to build a school in Burma, feed hungry kids in India, and put cameras in the hands of Cubans, if I can, with the proceeds of the book. So that's fantastic i didn't know that that's yeah. great yeah no good deed goes unpunished trust me when i tell you that <laughs> <laughs> okay well thanks everyone for joining us thank you vincent for a fantastic presentation hope you all enjoyed it and hope to see you again on another webinar thanks everyone thank you